thanks for making it to, to join us this lovely Saturday morning. Um, and uh, we've got a fantastic speaker that I'm going to introduce you to today to set us off on this journey towards uh, understanding what our legacy is going to be, what we want it to be, and how we can make it. Uh, and so I'm going to introduce to my friend and colleague, uh, Cam Cameron Maroof, Dr. Cameron Maroof. I've got a few notes here that he prepared. <laughs> uh, so lots of industry experience. Cameron's very much rooted in practice. Um, lots of experience he brings to the classroom, allied to his extensive research work in all sorts of areas, particularly um, AI and operate, uh, supply That's chain. Um, he also has been published uh, quite regularly in uh, high quality magazines such as GQ. Uh, <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> um, Doesn't surprise me. Information systems, frontiers, all sorts of other high quality stuff. Lots of radio and television appearances. Uh, but it's a little known fact that one of it on his CV, I, I got a quick glimpse of, he's got down there that he's um, Bradford and District Under 11's Hurdles champion in, <laughs> in 1997, aged 18. <laughs> so, with that, um, I'm going to hand over to Cameron, who's got, got a fascinating talk lined up for us on uh, AI, what we need to know, but sometimes they're not asking. Thanks, Cameron. Thank you so much, Nick, for the introduction. Thank you, everyone. Uh, and you kind of all beaten me to the round of applause. So I say getting you here on a Saturday morning means we all deserve another round of applause. So I feel let's follow So, yeah. For me, my, my wife had kicked me out of bed and said, you're loud going on Saturday, this is a point. So um, I also have to kind of drag myself out. But thanks for being here, guys. Um, today's session essentially is uh, around pretty much what Nick has uh, kind of alluded towards uh, AI in business. I kind of some of the questions that you kind of might think are maybe probably too trivial sometimes, or questions that you might actually think, ooh, how do we ask and how do we frame that? And hopefully through some of the research that I do, um, some of the consultancy work that I do alongside the university, I've kind of hopefully alluded to some of those answers um, there. So just a quick introduction, which Nick's actually doing a really good job on. Um, I am an associate professor in supply chain analytics. I lead our MSc Applied AI and Data Analytics MSc, which is the largest recruiting MSc as per HESA data across the whole of the UK. It's been funded twice by the Office of Students, uh, over £2 million pounds in funding. Um, and I'm pretty much uh, kind of pleased to say uh, I'm, I'm an advocate for the university. I have to appear um, on kind of a reputable uh, sharing research that we do and the opportunities that we're able to afford for organisations um, and so on and so forth. So, um, so my, my kind of presentation is going to have some sort of questions that are kind of be asking the audience and also kind of reflecting on myself as well. And the first one I thought is the talks of AI. Is, we heard extensively yesterday on the biases of AI, particularly during the AI summit. So I thought I'd ask um, Jay Craft. Anyone come across Jay Craft, a generative AI platform? which pretty much generates images for you. So you kind of put in all weird and some wonderful combinations, you know, tell me what X might look like or create this image for me, and it pretty much generates it for you. So I asked it was, hey, I show me what today's workshop will look like. So in other words, I must have thought something along the lines of um, somebody leading an AI session during the end of the year, somebody, please tell me what that might look like. So this is what it came up with. Now, it's interesting, it's interesting, because I kind of expect something on this line, and quite for me, Jack looks like you are going to say, looks quite similar to you. Um, but that was part of kind of what I was expecting, and that kind of went bringing you on to one of the first topics uh, for today. So I kind of 
added a, a little uh, prompt to say, not accurate, please try to be more realistic. Okay, so this is what the, uh, the, the, uh, the algorithm brought up. They probably assumed that when I said it's not realistic, it's the fact that there's not many audiences you could see, but not the fact that I was alluding to actually the picture, right? So what does that actually mean? Like how does this connect to the first theme of the session? Is biases, right? In the academic field, um, it's often referred to as the lack of diversification in AI. Or I, I kind of excuse uh, the phraseology, but the, the white guy problem is often what's referred to in AI. Now, what does that mean? So in terms of AI itself, in terms of the skill sets, it's predominantly dominated by males, middle-aged, and often those biases may come into the actual algorithm, but we use some practical examples of that. So kind of the first question, and I allude to this, and I kind of close the loop on this towards the end of the session, is biases, right? How do you manage biases in a field that's evolving? Right. And it's even for the technologists, it's very hard to keep on top of the trend. So how do we manage that disposition of AI assume that if somebody, you know, just this example here, a professor would look like Lil Wayne. But the flip side of the point is, which I come on to the next slide actually, but research has also shown when asked to organizations, so a research study was conducted um, by the IMB, and nearly three quarters of the organizations had said that they were failing to reduce bias within the AI solution. So, why is the solution were providing creativity, were opening up opportunities, they did find there were biases embedded into the, the responses into the solutions that are being put forward. So, bias is really like something that needs to be addressed and adapted. And then you also get the flip side of the challenge. It's where you're trying to overcompensate for this reason. And I'm not sure if any of you came across sort of some of the, sort of the controversies with Google's Gemini AI recently. Any come across? So they actually embedded in the algorithms to avoid the, the, the biases of kind of white males, AI. The algorithms are putting people, they, they only put people of color. So it's kind of all compensating here, where you're trying to actually show, okay, but it's incorrect. So there were factually incorrect uh, the images being generated, right? Uh, and this was an example of founders of, of, of the US and a whole lot of others. So kind of the local culture is also creeping. So how do you best manage that? On one hand, you've got biases inherently just due to how the field has evolved. And on the flip side, you're trying to resolve this, but going to give the experience. So in a, an ongoing conversation that goes in, that doesn't need to be had. Oh, well, there are two questions that have already been uh, kind of discussed. Um, my third question really is, what do we mean by intelligence, right? Artificial intelligence, AI, but what do we inherently refer to as intelligence? I'm sort of kind of all thinking of the floor here. How would you interpret, how would you say you would explain what intelligence is. Any takers? What would we how do we describe intelligence? An understanding of an action. An understanding of an action? Yeah. Anyone else? Information? Yeah. Yes, actionable. So, so being able to action all information. So let's have a look at kind of the academic literature and, and kind of try to conceptualize this from the context of AI. So intelligence kind of put into four into four key areas, right? So we have cognitive intelligence, active intelligence, we have adaptive intelligence, and what we refer to as collective intelligence. So kind of if you go through the academic literature in terms of how academics have defined what intelligence means, both in terms of an engineering perspective, but also in its most broadest context. It kind of falls into four key 
areas. So the example of cognitive intelligence is comprehending and speaking the language, right? Learning a language, speaking and engaging in that particular discourse. Active intelligence, a frog catching the fly with his phone, right? So actually, it knows that it's to do something, but in order for it to initiate an action, there has to be some engagement and movement. So connecting those aspects together. Adaptive intelligence and kind of based on kind of nature in general, you know, sunflowers turn their face towards the sun. Uh, and this is in heaven, it's natural, it doesn't need a problem, it does it because it knows what needs to do it. So looking at this kind of more from a biomimicry perspective. And then collective intelligence. So actually utilizing intelligence based on the collective. And an example here we have is of a colony of ants that can find the shortest path. So I want to flip the question back to you guys. So in terms of AI, so when we talk about artificial intelligence, if we were to conceptualize the intelligence of AI based on what we inherently refer to AI as, um, as, as, as people, as per our understanding, which of these would you say AI can do? And which of these do you think AI probably can't do at this moment in time? What do we think? Any thoughts? AI yeah, can do all of them except adapt. Good. So that's a good uh, uh, kind of. I'll come back to that. So, sorry, what's your name? Clint. 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 So Clint thinks cognitive, active, and collective is pretty much readily available for AI systems, but not necessarily adaptive. How many of us agree with it? Raise of hands if we agree with Clint on that. So it looks like Flint, it's just you at the moment. <laughs> Any of the takers? And AI do all of these short answers? AI can do all of these for perspectives. We have a few, okay. So let's have a look. Let's look at some practical examples. So cognitive AI, you probably come across hours ago, the famous piece of a chess player who lost to uh, to, to the uh, algorithm. So that's an example of cognitive AI. Active AI of robots, the Sophia robot, retail robots, your most traditional form of AI is automation, where you, the assembly line, that's an example of active AI. We jump on to adaptive later and collective AI, swarm AI. You know, many of you must have now seen when it comes to the New Year celebration, instead of fireworks, particularly in China, they've been using small AI drones and absolutely impressive drones to kind of represent and celebrate uh, and visually have that impact. Similar to what Clint said, there's a question mark around adaptive. So we can have a discussion on this. Can AI really adapt in its truest nature? Now, yes, it can adapt. If it's been trained to adapt, and kind of that's one of the, the discussions that I'll be kind of bringing forward uh, during the course of, of, of this. Session. Face with the AI, and I kind of conceptualize this very quickly. The first one is data dependence, right? Your AI is only as good as the data you feed it, right? So that's straight away should kind of indicate towards how you're able to adapt in a situation or circumstance when AI hasn't been put through that. The pandemic is an example of that, right? One of the reasons why we weren't able to navigate through the challenges. Why change point of view is because we've never had the world shut down. So no matter how complex our models of AI were, we weren't still able to understand what good might look like. Now, God forbid, if ever there was a lockdown again, you'd be sure that organization would be stocking up on toilet paper and of course those other interesting things because it's happened before. So data dependency is key in terms of adaptability. Rich and generalization, right? 
it's very good, but it's very good at making those generalizations within the context in which it's been trained. If you take it outside of that context, it's going to provide you some really weird and wonderful insights. Chat GPT, Gemini AI, sometimes you put stuff in there and it's probably lost, but then you're thinking, how does that make sense? You prompt it further and it may try to re collaborate its responses again because it's only contingent on AI trained data, right? And for me, it's also limited common sense reasoning, right? Why if humans through social socialization will have the ability to base decisions on intuition and logic and common sense. Unfortunately, AI will struggle with that. Because again, it goes back to dependency on data and its context. So when we think of intelligence, again, break that down in an organization. What is it that you're trying to achieve? And often it's not adaptive AI that we need in organization. It's probably the, the, the most likely and most formative for it to understand and to be so. Uh, some responses off the back of that. And let's go to the earliest, you know, and I have to say AI is now the most work. It's because we've allowed the people system to flourish, right? I often give the example of, you know, you, you, if you think of when we transition from a person car to automobiles, in order for that transition to happen, we required road system, we required fuel stations, driving schools, and in a host of things in order to allow that transition to take place. AI is no different. AI has been around for a lot longer than you probably think, 60, 70 years. But now we have a cloud. Now we have the, 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 the more powerful processing system that's allowing AI to do what it needs to do. So again, it was pretty much limited in its early disposition. But now we have the ecosystem which allows it to flourish. But my next question is, does it need to be perfect? Right? And often you hear, and all the cases that you do hear and, and, and see in the news is that AI has gone wrong. Right? So my inherent question is, does AI need to be perfect? Again, I want to open the floor to sort of hear what your thoughts and views might be on this. What's your take, guys, in terms of AI? Why are you so obsessed with AI having to be perfect? Yes. Let me give it a try, because let's say what's on my mind from the previous presentation part that well is, would you meet, or would you ask that same question for you? Very good. Good. So often reflect on the fact that that to my next slide, but a very good point, actually. So, you know, would you expect humans to be perfect? Right? Humans make mistakes. But why are we so obsessed with AI and being perfect? Yes. Yes, it doesn't need to be perfect. And as a you said that it can understand difference in scale between my two patients and conditions inside the room. So it needs to be more perfect. So right? So if you're looking at it when it refers to humans, decision making, which is why AI and health has so many opportunities, but the uptake at the moment is well not great, particularly for clinicians, right? Because there's this concern and we've got image here and we'd be interested the image used given uh, the, the context in which he operates in the world of AI and healthcare. But again, context also matters. But any other thoughts? Why should we be obsessed with AI be perfect to that? If you heard. Yeah. So if it was just a data process and taking a lot of data processing person, they still in line with everything that was all this time to check it. But if we're suddenly promoting it to CEO, that's very tough. It's all about the oversight. Yeah, good. So it depends on where it's been used in the organization and the ramifications of its application, right? Where and what is the impact of the AI, and how may it have an adverse effect if the decisions go wrong? But I mean, let's take a step back and go back to what the gentleman made earlier. And again, this is based on if you look at the initial conceptualization of AI, right? The main difference between human intelligence and machine intelligence is human intelligence is imperfect and can adapt to various situations, right? 
while machine intelligence aims to lead the perfect optimized solutions. So in its disposition itself, there's an expectation that actually we're bringing in AI to overcome human errors. So why should AI in the first place make errors? And that's the disposition and the mindset that needs to actually change in organizations as well, right? Because if the AI needs to uh, and not correct outcome, we always think actually the AI is rubbish or it will be plotted all over the news, right? But again, going back to the point of it's meant to lead us to optimal solutions and optimize, but it's still to not be perfect. So again, the expectation piece is very, very important and significant here, right? We can adapt, the AI can adapt, but if AI is given the time, given the data, it can get very close to being perfect, right? So again, understanding the context in which, and again, let's frame this from an organizational context. It's not going to provide you all the solutions, and it's not always going to be perfect. But what it is going to provide you is the ability to get as close to optimizing solutions and decisions as possible if you allow it the time and provide the data to do so. Confidence is important, right? It's always about understanding the data story. So I have, I've been doing some workshops through the university with Emirates Global Aluminium out uh, in Dubai. And we spent a lot of time in the data story because there's an assumption that actually the data department deals with the data, they come to the operations team, and we just want to make use of it and, 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 and translate that to some sort of value proposition. We want to create some value off the back of the data, but no, we need to understand where the data came from. The provenance of the data is very important. And again, in organizations, because of the lack of skills, because of pretty much, unfortunately speaking different languages, the AI guys, the more tech people will be speaking different languages to those who are actually using it in a functional manner. There's often not that, 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 that interchange of knowledge and understanding. So problems is important. And I often try to conceptualize this in terms of data being probably more valuable than anything that we have in today's day and age. Often you, you, you come across the, the, the phraseology of Data is the new oil. To look at this from a geopolitical context, um, organized countries that have data, uh, that, that have oil, so the other most valuable, I think, in the world, look at from a context of uh, companies and organizations. So we are leading organizations in the world, all have access to data, be the Amazons of this world, the Googles, and so on and so forth. So problems of the data could also be important. Let's focus on the solutions later, but let's try to understand what the data story is. How do we then conceptualize and make all of this down, right? And again, I often say we can get into the sort of statistical gymnastics of AI and use all the fancy buzzwords and terms, but in reality, it's understanding where the provenance is, right? Garbage in and garbage out, a term that's been used for, for many, many years. Your analysis is only as good as the data that you are feeding or the context in which you're providing the data. And just like this nesting dolls, I like to kind of pick lots of this so we kind of understand what we mean. So AI, in general, if we break this down in a very high level and listen perspective, it's powered by machine learning. Okay, and machine learning also falls into kind of two, some could argue three and four in today's day and age. But broadly into two broad techniques, supervised machine learning and unsupervised machine learning. So in one instance, you're specifying to the AI algorithm what it is you're looking for, right? So you want to recognize uh, the faults and defects when it comes to production on, on, on production yeah. lines. So you want to identify facial recognition. Um, you want to distinguish animals, uh, a dog from a cat, so on and so forth, right? Your concerns about machine learning is you actually want them a machine learning algorithm to pull out patterns from the data. So those kind of broad AI machine learning perspectives, but it's the data that's underpinning all of this. Your machine learning models are only as good as the data. So aside from the AI the machine learning supervised and supervised, the data is the most important piece. 
With all the work that I do, the first question I ask is, what are your data sources? Because they may have the expectations of trying to achieve data. Actually, when you see the veracity of the data or the variety of the data, they have the volumes of data, you will really pitch that idea more realistically. So the provenance of the data matters as and is important as well. But again, going back to my point, it doesn't need to be perfect, right? And we're obsessed with AI being perfect. But let's have a look at despite some of these issues and challenges that we face, research is showing how AI is still able to impact organizations. So BCG did a survey most recently, and what they've essentially found is companies that are able to successfully implement AI have more productive innovation funnels. They are able to generate more ideas in organizations that don't. Five times as much, right? So implementing, uh, from, from generating ideas to validation and ideas that actually get incubated. Again, it's a collective, whole creative process. It's not just the AI, it's the AI that's allowing you and providing you with the, the notion and idea of the creativity to bring those things together. So we shouldn't be looking at actually the world, now accurate is the algorithm, but we should be, but it's important, but what we should be also focusing on is what data are we feeding it in order for it to get as accurate or close to optimize the solution as, as possible. And again, the question isn't whether AI can have an impact, it's whether companies are implementing AI for use cases within the potential to drive business value. You have organizations that may not necessarily have huge infrastructure, but they connect to the cloud and they collect a huge amounts of data from social media. And for them, they can do AI machine learning, do very targeted specific data mining just off the back of having connection with the data and storing that data in the cloud facility, right? So it's the, the value proposition that needs to be focused on, not on how perfect the solution the algorithm actually is. And where to start, right? And often this is the question we always get, particularly when we're working with businesses and in research, okay, where do we actually start when it comes to AI? So how do we incorporate and bring the AI into the organization? You may have data, right? It's not really well managed. Or you may be actually data that actually without purpose. You're collecting it because it's part of your, uh, it is part of the data you collect when transactions occur or the activity that you may be having with your, your, your business environment. So where to start? It kind of brings me on to uh, what you all probably heard in the past, Peter Brookers. We all heard of culture eat strategy for breakfast, right? You've obviously heard this term in many contexts um, and kind of bringing the, the true value of people and the vision of people within an organization. But for me, it's strategy eats AI for breakfast, right? And as you can see quite clearly, I've all the way strategy uh, with culture that I couldn't find anything a bit more uh, uh, creative. I tried AI yeah, to go a robot saying these breakfast. So anyway, uh, we don't value it. But, for me, it's like a strategy, the vision of the AI. Because if you are able to strategize the AI and connect that into your organization, you will know what you're collecting and the purpose of you're collecting it for. It goes back to the points that I was making. It might not be perfect, but for what we're using it for, it might not require us to be perfect. It might allow us to have those functions or help us validate and triangulate what our perceptions might be, what our thoughts might be. It might be actually more at the highest security level, right? So the purpose of AI has to be defined before you try to deploy the solutions. And for me, AI is just the tool. The strategy is the roadmap. The example is akin to you having, you know, a, a very powerful sports car, but if you've got a driver who's not able to navigate that, or if you put it in a train like in a desert, put a Ferrari in a desert, and really get the results, but you put it on a racetrack with an experienced driver, he or she will maximize the value from the AI. So, strategizing your AI is very, very important. And a lot of the work that academics, when they are going into organizing, is about taking a step back. The AI solution will do what it needs to do. 
what are you doing it for? What are you using it for? And do you have the resources, do you have the data and infrastructure in place to make that work? And there are different ways in which you could conceptualize and bring in AI to an organization. Now, first of all, it's understanding its orientation, right? Is the AI sitting in a department where it's going to be supporting a particular department? Or is the AI, this was actually co created with our work in each year, um, which is what happened for us to share. Or is the AI actually not a caste specific but organizational wide? So, do we have an AI first strategy? But everything in the organization will have some form of machine learning, analysis, synthesization of data that's in place. Or well, actually, is it just happening a particular task in a particular department of an organization, which often is the case, right? Often organizations, the manual operations, where they're using the AI marketing, where they're using the SF1. Is it an organization wide thing or is it a task orientated element? And where is the problems? Again, going back to my point, garbage in, garbage out. If we're using it for a particular function, do we have the veracity of the data? Do we have the right to the data feeding into that department to help us make informed decisions? I, when I was working in industry, uh, I worked in Morrison's before I joined academia in supply chain. And they are interested in going with the loop beyond the AI algorithm at the time. And it's really interesting. So when I used to work at the Wakefield uh, Junction 41 site, um, and the, the normal process for us to actually pick orders for stores was based on manual inputs from store managers. So store managers would essentially tell us based on weekly trends, these are some of the items that actually we need to pick. And it would be based on stock trends. But again, we've got an intuition at that too. Well. So there will always be a gear for table. So when they deployed the blue yonder uh, uh, a solution. It was really interesting because suddenly we were seeing some you know, very strange kind of trends. You know, there'd be orders of more washing powder, more beer, and, and pop and crisps than, than normal. And the, the, again, the interesting thing that the, the AI was doing was it wasn't just capturing the data based on historic trends and sales, but also external data that was being fed into that. So, weather, for example. So one of the things we saw was a high washing powder. We were thinking, why is this? And there wasn't, you know, the, it wasn't particularly obvious why that was the case. But the algorithm had identified that this forecasted heat wave from the When it's warm, what happens? It's wet when we put the washing out, right? So what the what the algorithm identified is actually when it's really warm, washing powder gets sold. Now, we started to work into the AI optimized solutions and the external data source to incorporate within our data. You just probably looking at store data, thinking at this time, this year, this is how much we sold, this time last week, this is how much we sold. And we probably wouldn't be able to, to, to fulfill the, the demand on the stock. When we see events happen, sporting events, beer, crisps, snacks, again, so the AI is able to, so again, the data story is very important. And how are you tapping into an update to tell you that story? I'm mindful of the time, so I will kind of proceed on. And often your biases to adopting AI fall into a host of these. I mean, this is based on some of the research um, that we've done, we are doing that, and we have been doing it. It's one cost your rest in works of AI, particularly when it comes to niche industries, when it comes to healthcare, in particular, robotics, and so on and so forth. Security and privacy concerns is the major one, right? And you know, the more you hear about data leaks, the more you hear about the concerns around infrastructure and even the cloud, it, 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 it does give people concerns. Ongoing maintenance and what is required for AI tools, the PPS at which it's actually evolving. People actually are not really sure actually how do we implement this and how do we maximize the value from this. Weak integration of capabilities. Systems not talking to one another. So, particularly why it's important to have an understanding of is it organizational wide or task specific because you need interoperability, you need systems to talk to one another, you need systems to share data with one another. And again, limited proven applications apart from proof of concept, right? It looks really good on paper, but in a particular context, in a particular situation, it's the scalability issues that we are challenged with. 
I need a political organization kind of develop this quadrant uh, uh, with, along with uh, one of our collaborators out in Turkey, in fact. Um, uh, Ibrahim Fuscu. And it pretty much tries to put, uh, uh, it tries to capture you know, what type of roles um, an organizational tasks would be impacted by AI, right? So the problem we have is, you have emotional activities and job orientation, you have more logical roles, more unique tasks, and more repetitive tasks. And that is kind of a mapping process to really help you understand where in the organization do we require AI? Will it be task or organizational wide? So for instance, if your role uh, within your organization, a job, a, a task per se, is logical, but also very unique, very unique task, then you could expect it to be a mostly human kind of uh, a, 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 a role, right? Because it requires that unique skill, which might be intuition, it might be high risk, high state, you know, conditions, etc. If it requires emotional equality and it's unique, then you could expect it to be purely human, right? Because that emotional agility, that emotional elements is important as well. If it's repetitive and logical, then you could expect AI to pretty much play, play, play a role there, and it'd be purely AI. But it's just kind of trying to put roles and, and kind of collaborate uh, with AI together. If it's lots of emotional elements, but also repetitive tasks, they could play again, probably be mostly AI with some human interventions. So again, sometimes it's not necessarily a solution, but actually the nature of the job which requires you to understand where AI provides value and plays value. I've got a few minutes left, so I'm going to shoot through these slides. Question six, so how will AI change the future of work? And I've conceptualized this just based on some recent reports, the World Economic Forum's future, future of Jobs report, for instance, um, has kind of picked upon this. The four spoke extensively about this. AI will drive job creation. Pretty much pushes back the, the, the argument often we fear of AI taking over jobs, right? That's a conversation in itself. But nearly half of the companies that were actually um, surveyed with the future of jobs said AI uh, will create new roles, focusing on areas of developing, implementing, and maintaining AI technology. So it's creating the new industry in its own right. So there's opportunities we have there, particularly across healthcare, education, and professional services, areas where technology hasn't matured, right? It's got huge potentials, education, example, healthcare, but not really taken off. Businesses will prioritize AI skills. The more you are seeing the advancements of AI, the more there needs to be the prioritization of AI skills. Our course is an example, delivering the business world Huge uptake, organizations and people understand the value of the cross fertilization between functional and the AI. And augmentation over automation. So often the challenges were around actually really automated roles, but now actually it's about augmentation. It's about actually providing those nuances, it's providing the ideas for organizations to take forward. So it may not necessarily be the automation you were concerned about, but the augmentation of that as well. But we have to be mindful, and I won't go through each and every one of this, it's still not perfect. And that's kind of the key message that I'm going to pass over. There are a host of examples. You will find them on a daily basis where AI is making mistakes. Some of them, not possibly with others, hugely costly. Could be possible in the context of brand, right? Organization of brand, brand equity, reputation. You know, there's a host of examples here from racism to anti Semitism. Um, and again, because the AI actually, either the data or the people programming the data, data nuances fall into this. This is only yesterday, believe it or not, right? So, 20 million pounds um, defect scam. Uh, through uh, a phone call to somebody actually wiring the 20 million in whatever capacity off the back of a phone call which they thought the senior manager had authorised. This was yesterday last night, actually, I was just checking if there's anything 
more topic that I could put into the introduction to lines. Racial profiling, again, going back to my point of the provenance, the data is only as good as, the AI is only as good as data, you feed it, and the data is only as good as the people programming, and the bias is coming into this, which is why, again, there's a need for diversification of that. So how do we redress the balance? And for me, it's these particular points here. Diverse and representative data. Very important. That is in terms of the skills and the people who are actually in the field. Having algorithmic transparency, explaining the AI, why has the AI decided to make this decision? And that's where the focus now is on white box algorithms, where actually we want to know why the AI has made those particular decisions. Continuous monitoring and auditing, there needs to be governance and external auditing on how AI is being used in organizations, and that governance piece is lacking. Diverse development teams, again, going back to our point of diversifying the world, which can have been focused on your uh, overall outputs, and ethical guidelines and standards. And again, these are areas where we are lacking and falling behind. The, the Brexit situation and how data had fed into that narrative, the Trump campaign and how data had led into that has shown that it's due to lack of governance and guiding and still, and the policy makers are lagging behind, and that's the, the view of the reality. So my final question then is, which is often asked, will AI take over our jobs, right? It's a common question and a common theme. And for me, it's, AI won't take your job or business, but the people who learn and apply AI will. And that's what it comes down to, which is why you will then have our friend who I have managed to uh, start my own learning to the context. Thank you guys. Sorry I've gone over a little bit, Nick. I know you attempted to kick me off stage. Uh, any questions? We have time questions. So, uh, I I'm, I'm around. Yes, I'm around. So maybe we could take questions in the uh, in the panel, but also in the networking in uh, after the end of the next session. Yeah. Thank you, guys. <laughs>